Examining Ethics with Andy Cullison is hosted by the Janet Prindle Institute for Ethics at DePaul University. The views expressed here are the opinions of the individual speakers alone. They do not represent the position of DePaul University or the Prindle Institute. Hi, Christian. Hi, Sandra. Welcome to the studio. Thank you. I don't know about you, but with all the protests that have been happening recently, I've noticed a ton of criticism being directed at protests and protesters, even when they're nonviolent. Yeah, my my Twitter feed has been packed recently with people like responding to protesters and responding to the methods that they're using. And it seems like people always have something critical to say, whether it's like setting a garbage can on fire or just, you know, taking to the streets and kind of blocking traffic for a Saturday morning or something. Yeah. So it's like, it doesn't matter violent or nonviolent. It seems like people just have a lot of problems with the way people are protesting. Exactly. And yeah, we noticed that recently with the women's march and the inauguration protests, but I mean, for the past few years, it's been happening a ton with the Black Lives Matter movement, too, um, where no matter how nonviolent a protest is, there's still something that people have to say about how they should have done it better or how they shouldn't have protested the way that they did. And it doesn't seem to matter how nonviolent a protest is, um, it's still going to receive criticism. And and not just about the ideology, about specifically about how the protests are happening. So I want to show you a mashup of people who are criticizing nonviolent protests. Half of the country is angry right now. I get it. But before we start calling the reaction a protest, let's get something straight. A protest is a peaceful objection to a grievance. A bunch of sore losers occupying a space is called a tantrum. And that's exactly what we're seeing around the nation after Trump's historic and earned victory. There's been a lot of Black Lives Matter protests and rallies. People blocking entrance to off ramps in the interstate, people blocking the downtown tunnel out here in Virginia where I am. Now, my thing is this, what is the purpose? You blocking the downtown tunnel prevent people from getting home to Portsmouth. You don't know if they got a sick relative or whatever to look after. NFL quarterback Colin Kaepernick's silent protest of the national anthem is spreading, but so is a controversy around it. And joining me now is Ben Ferguson, the host of the Ben Ferguson Show. What was your response? Uh, I'm not surprised by this, that, that obviously there's a lot of people that are going to back him and support him. The big issue now moving forward is is you've got the anniversary of 9-11 on Sunday, and there's other athletes that are jumping on this. And the big question is, on a day when we had such an American tragedy and where America came together uh, after 9-11, is it appropriate for teams and some of these players to not honor the American flag and the men and women that have served this country? That's my thing. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't have words. I don't have a response. <laughs> you speechless right now? Yeah. Yeah. I'm speechless too, honestly. I thought this kind of criticism um, of nonviolent protesters was a new thing. Um, but I did some research and it turns out it's not. I actually found criticism of protesters dating all the way back to the 1940s. And at the time, it was directed at these incredible, nonviolent, anti-segregation protesters in Seymour, Indiana during World War II. Ooh, that sounds really interesting. Yeah. So Seymour is a small city in the south of Indiana, and it's the location of Freeman Airfield, which was an Air Force training base during World War II. And a protest called the Freeman Field Mutiny occurred there. And that led to the official desegregation of the entire military. Wow. Wow. I want to hear that story. I will tell you that story. So in the 1940s, the U.S. military was supposed to be desegregated already, which is sort of weird to think about because, I mean, we usually think of the U.S. as desegregating in the 60s. But it was supposed to be desegregated. I'm going to take a wild guess that... In practice, the military wasn't actually desegregated in the 1940s. A bing, 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 bing. Okay. <laughs> that is correct, Christian. What happened was that 
the NAACP, the black press, and the presidents of historically black colleges and universities in the country had to band together to fight for the first all-black group of aviators in the Air Force. Was that like the um, Tuskegee Airmen? Yeah. So some people have heard of the Tuskegee Airmen before, and they were the first black group of aviators, and they flew in World War II, but they mostly functioned as escorts. So when they came back from war, they wanted to be bombardiers instead, which meant being able to fly bomber planes in combat. But that was a struggle too. Even these experienced pilots, these war veterans, had to fight just to become bombardiers. Why would they want to become bombardiers? I'm going to let J. Todd Moy, history professor at the University of North Texas, answer that. And one of the reasons for that was that they knew that after the war, pilots who were trained as multi-engine pilots, bomber pilots, would have better job prospects with civilian airlines. Uh, so they, they were pushing for this and pushing for this, and, and finally the Army Air Corps, against the judgment of the, uh, of the generals who ran it, accepted African Americans into bomber training. Uh, they trained as, as pilots at Tuskegee. They trained as bombardier navigators at bases throughout the country. Um, and, and they finally, once they had trained enough men to form a unit, they, they created the 477th Bombardment Group. But the struggle wasn't over. The 477th faced a lot of discrimination and difficulty getting the training they were supposed to be getting as bombardiers. But the thing we're talking about today is that on every base they were sent to, there were segregated officers' clubs. Okay, so I want to know more about the segregation, but first of all, I need to ask, what is an officers' club? An officers' club is like a country club. So it's a place that officers can go after working really hard all day and bring their wives and sort of relax and drink. Okay, I get it, yeah. And these officers' clubs were usually the places where black officers encountered the most segregation. So when they were transferred to Seymour, Indiana, and they found two distinct officers' clubs, one for black officers and one for white, they got pretty fed up. Well, yeah, because segregation's not legal. It's It's not allowed, right? Yeah. I mean, in the military, it definitely wasn't allowed. So the way that the commander of the 477th Colonel Selway was able to finagle this segregation was that he never said explicitly that this officer's club is for black officers and this one is for white officers. Instead, he said that one was for trainees, which just happens to be all of the black officers, and the other was for instructors, which just happened to be all of the white officers. Wait, I thought the, I thought the members of the 477th were experienced pilots. Yeah, some of them were decorated war veterans. Like, some of them had come back from combat abroad. And according to Moy, in order to make some of this 477 sound like trainees, you had to really defy logic. The only, the only way you could make this work is by bending logic into a pretzel. And um, by, by any rational standard... A combat veteran is is not a trainee, and um, someone with 200 or 500 hours in a cockpit is not a trainee. Um, but but again, the the goal to keep the facility segregated that ideal was more of a priority than every other priority on the base. So even before the 477th arrives in Seymour, Indiana, they had heard about these segregated officers' clubs. And so they had started to plan what they were going to do about it once they got there. And luckily for them, they had uh, Lieutenant Coleman Young amongst them, who was an experienced organizer. And so he was really able to train the rest of the officers in nonviolent resistance. And he knew the law inside and out. Which means he knows that there's a law stating there's no segregation in the military? Yes, he knew that. In fact, there was even a specific provision about officers' clubs. Here's retired colonel and historian of the Air Force, Alan Grotman. 
So in 1940, he wrote a regulation, 210-10, Army Regulation 210-10, that said that any officer's club on a post is open to any officer on a post. Well, that would mean blacks and whites. But he also knew that there were different laws for wartime. So we're still in World War II. We're still at the end of World War II here. And he knows that the law that applies at that time are the Articles of War, which is basically regular military law on steroids. So anything you do wrong, if you're in the military during war, it's really bad. Like, you could be sentenced to death for just the most basic infractions. So he knows the Articles of War, and he knows that it's that much more important for them to be really careful in the way that they protest. So he's the one that makes sure that they're not violating any other law or code or standard so that all the attention would be on the fact that there are segregated officers clubs and not that they had like a hair out of place. So after Young prepped them for nonviolent resistance, they went for it. Here's Lieutenant Wendell Freeland, who was part of the first group to attempt entry into the White Officers Club, to tell you what happened in his own words. When the 477th was transferred to Freeman Field, Indiana, the command decided that there would be a separation of officers. So they established what was then the Officers Club, and it was called the White Officers Club. What was then the non-commissioned Officers Club became the Colored Officers Club. But we knew, we learned, that Army regulations provided that there should be no discrimination with officer personnel by reason of race, creed, or color. We decided, because of that Army regulation, that Selway, who was the commanding officer, was wrong. And we would test it. So we went on a choo-choo train to uh, Freemansfield, Indiana. I went to the White Officers Club. I was greeted by a white officer, I think a lieutenant colonel, who told me not to go in. I said, thank you, sir, and went in. And I went into the foyer and sat in the chair, found a magazine. I sat, read the magazine for a while, and then decided, having established a beachhead, and I left. And when I left, the same officer or another officer said, consider yourself under arrest of quarters. Wow, that, that gives me goosebumps. That's, that's just such a brave thing to do. It really is. And Freeland wasn't the only brave officer. Over a hundred officers participated in this protest and tried to enter the White Officers Club over the course of a couple of days. And they were all arrested. Wait, what are they arrested for? So the commander of the 477th, Colonel Selway, the one who segregated the clubs in the first place, is trying to convince everyone that this isn't a race issue, completely unrelated to race, and that his order was perfectly legal and that the protesters knowingly disobeyed a base regulation. And that base regulation is that trainees are not allowed in the instructor club and vice versa. Okay, so the base regulation basically for Selway is saying, this isn't about race, this is about trainees and officers. And then he can also say, you're breaking a base regulation. You're not just like protesting segregation. You're breaking a base regulation. Right. Which, if we'll remember, in the Articles of War, if you disobey an order, that could lead to death. Mm. So Freeland and the others who were arrested entering the club is sort of part one of this protest. But at this point, Selway realizes that it looks pretty bad that he has 100 over 100 black officers locked up on his base. So he tries to make it look even more like these protesters are just troublemakers. So he wants the black officers to admit that they broke the rules, and he wants them to admit that those rules also aren't racist. Even though they pretty clearly are. Yeah. So part two of this protest is resisting Selway and what he wants from them, which is a confession. We went back to our BOQs, and arrest of quarters meant staying in that area and not going beyond that area. Then the command, we were released from arrest of quarters, and the command uh, ordered us to attend a meeting. And the command passed out 
base regulation. Selway was not there, but the command through lieutenant colonels told us that base regulations preempted army regulations, that uh, every officer was deemed to know all base regulations upon entering a base. And the command wanted us to sign that we had read and understood these base regulations. A number of questions were asked by men at that time. May I sign it and say I read it, I've read it, but I don't understand it. May I sign it and say I've read it, but I don't agree with it. They were told, yes, you may do that. That'll be sufficient. Well, there was a larger group of us who didn't do that. And uh, when the command found out there was a group, it arranged for hearings before certain officers for each of us. Uh, I went to the headquarters, and there was four officers, white officers, of course, a couple of lieutenant colonels, and then a Negro quartermaster officer. And uh, I was asked by the light colonel, who probably was the executive officer of, of the group, to sign the document that I had not signed in the meeting. And I remained uh, mute. I have to put this in. Nobody believes I could ever remain mute, uh, but I did. Then he uh, gave me another piece of paper which said, asked me to sign it, and uh, I didn't do anything. So then one of the officers got up and read the article of war that provides that the failure to obey a direct order from your commanding officer is punishable by death or such other punishment as the court-martial may direct. Those are frightening words. I was 20 years old. They're frightening words even today. And then uh, I, Captain Anthony N. Chappie, U.S. Air Corps, da-da-da-da-da, order you sign that piece of paper. I did nothing. I was then arrested again, told I was in arrest quarters. On that night, there were 101 of us who refused to sign. We would tip our caps as we left so that the next guy would know he would not be alone. So that was our form of mutiny. And mind you, this whole time, Selway is on the phone with every higher up he can get into contact with to try to spin the situation. There are recorded phone conversations where he's complaining to General Hunter, who he reports to, that he doesn't understand why the black officers need to focus on race when he's never mentioned it or brought it up. But he literally made segregated officers clubs. Yes. Oh. No, there's no words. <laughs> <laughs> this is the Freeman Airfield Museum curator, Larry Bothy. What happened was they arrested all these people. Well, now it started to make the national news. Now, we didn't have the Internet and Twitter and all this stuff back in 1945. But nevertheless, you know, there were telephones and so forth. Well, it became an unpopular thing because they had arrested some World War II combat veterans. Here's Moy again. Uh, NAACP chapters throughout the Midwest started writing letters to the White House uh, demanding justice for, for the Freeman Field arrestees. Um, eventually, it became such a political embarrassment for the War Department that um, they did court-martial the three men who had been accused of uh, jostling another officer as they as they entered the, uh, the the officer's club, but they let the other 101 go. So three men are accused, but only one is actually found guilty of jostling a superior officer, and his name is Bill Terry. So he got in trouble for jostling, I guess? Jostling. Okay, so when I hear jostling... It makes me think of like just like walking past somebody and like bumping up against them or yeah, like I don't know. accidentally like brushing shoulders with a person. That's yeah. what I think of. Doesn't sound like a big deal, but yeah, <laughs> that is definitely what I think of too. And I was so surprised because at first when people were using that word with me, I thought it was just because I was talking to a lot of people who sort of sympathize with Bill Terry. And so we're toning down the sort of language that they were using to describe his offense or whatever. But I found the actual records, and in the official court documents, he is accused of jostling. Oh, wow. So in the official account, he got in trouble for jostling. Jostling, yes. 
So I thought all this jostling business was so ridiculous that I had to ask every historian I talked to about what what did jostling mean? And surprisingly, I got a pretty varied response from the historians I talked to. So Grotman said that the superior officer had been knocked to the ground. But Larry Bothy said Bill Terry might have brushed against the superior officer. So by the time I talked to Moy, I had to ask him, is jostling really a serious offense? It's it's not. Um, it, it basically amounts to getting into the physical space and actually touching another person, right? It's, sh- it's short of assault, but it's it's not respecting the physical space of another officer. And so um, they had to charge him with something. And because he entered the door of the officer's club while there was an officer there blocking the entryway, uh, that's what they could charge him with. <laughs> I guess just like, would a white officer ever be dishonorably discharged from the army for jostling? I don't know of any cases uh, where that would happen, and it would definitely be unlikely. Wait, so this doesn't sound like a mutiny at all. Is it still a mutiny? It was, and it wasn't. Here's Bothy again. I know. This thing, by the way, is recorded in history. It's the Freeman Field Mutiny, Mm -hmm. which sounds like it includes weapons and fighting and injury and maybe death. None of those things occurred. The worst thing that happened was a little pushing and shoving. So don't make it into some, like, bloody massacre because that wasn't what it was. Something really interesting to me was the motivations that people have for calling it or not calling it a mutiny. So most officers who actually participated in the protests, they do call it a mutiny because they absolutely were trying to overthrow the powers that be. But the government at the time called it that, as Friedland says, because they wanted these men to be killed. The uh, command really wanted us to be court martialed. Selway wanted us to be shot. And I think he had the support of our general. So they were released, but but what came of all this? I'll let both of you take it from here. So in the in the end, in the total scheme of things, no one was hurt. No one, except for one individual, Bill Terry, no one was substantially harmed by this. And it was Bill Terry's career that was harmed, not not bodily harm. And so maybe you might say it wasn't too big a deal. But it turned out to be because the, the Freeman mutiny was one of the catalysts that led to the final desegregation of the armed services. And I guess it was President Truman that said, enough is enough. The services are supposed to be desegregated, and by God, they're desegregated. At least that's what people say about President Truman's executive order 9981 in 1948 that called for equality in the military. But... Grotman's research points out that the Air Force takes almost a whole year to do so, and the Army doesn't desegregate until forced to during the Korean War. But still, the mutiny was a huge step towards desegregation and had real impacts on black aviators. Because up until that point, for example, no white person was ever commanded by a black person. That was unthinkable that a black person could tell a white person what to do. Truman finally said, that's enough. We're done with it. Black people can uh, command units if they're qualified, and those units can contain white people, and those white people damn soon better do what they're told to do, and so forth. So it was a significant step, the Freeman Field uh, mutiny with the Tuskegee Airmen, was a significant step in the final desegregation of our military services. 
Wow, so it sounds like the story has a good ending. Yeah, I mean, desegregating the entire military is not bad. It's not bad. Yeah, pretty good. (laughs) But Bill Terry is definitely a casualty of this story. Um, After being dishonorably discharged from the military, he becomes a lawyer, but he can never practice law because of the charges against him from the military. So so that charge against him of jostling, that kept him from doing his life's work, basically. Yeah. Jeez. I know. And what bothers me the most about Bill Terry's situation and all the rest of the officers who protested is that, in, in my view, every way that they protested was the right way. But they were still criticized for everything that they did. Yeah, it sounds like from all the things you told me, you know, they were polite. They didn't break any rules. They were following the law. You know, it seems nonviolent in every way. Yeah, but even while all of that is true, white newspapers still called them violent troublemakers. And actually, so did their commanding officers. What were the newspapers saying? Well, one newspaper called the Columbus Citizen called what happened at Freeman Field a riot. (laughs) A riot? A riot. And there's evidence that towns that had air bases were worried that the 477th would be transferred to their air base. And they didn't want them to come because supposedly they were violent or on some kind of civil rights crusade. And so and what were the what were the commanding officers saying? Well, so Selway was constantly criticizing the protesters' methods by saying that they should have done it in a different way. And he actually said one time that even if his order was illegal, they should have just followed it and, like, disagreed with it some other way after they followed it. Like, really just nitpicking on any detail he could find. And he also says constantly that he's afraid the 477th will erupt in violence. Even though... He acknowledges himself that they've never displayed any violence. And at one point, he even says that they're extremely polite. So if the protesters were doing everything right, you know, but they're still criticized for their methods, where are we supposed to go from here? Yeah, that's what I'm wondering, too. And what makes it even more frustrating is that the answer isn't just stop protesting. Because according to Moy, protests are essential for gaining equality. Schools didn't desegregate themselves. Um, Public accommodations didn't desegregate themselves. Officers clubs didn't desegregate themselves. African Americans had to stand up and do it themselves and force it and then force through whatever political process, force the government to come in uh, and, and say, no, you have to desegregate. It's just so unfair that the responsibility for fixing problems is usually on the shoulders of the people who are discriminated against. Yeah, it is so unfair. And even more awful is that no matter how you try to right that discrimination, even if you follow all the rules, you'll still be criticized. This is what I need to talk to you and Andy about. Some protesters who do everything right, like legally and nonviolently, are still criticized for their methods. But does that mean that we should never criticize protesters? That doesn't seem right either. So how should we talk about protests? Should we as a society criticize protesters' methods? Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about the specific stuff that I heard about the inauguration. So I some I had a conversation with somebody on Facebook who was like, oh, they shouldn't have blocked people from going into the inauguration. So I asked him, I said, um, okay, so, but that's a nonviolent protest. So I just want to like make you aware that you're saying that a nonviolent protest is not okay. 
and like what kind of protests would you be okay with then and then like I got this weird list of like you're not allowed to disturb people um like you're not allowed to disturb people on their way to work um because that can interfere with like them making money and like you're harming somebody that's not directly involved and it's so it's unfair and like there just seem to be all of these rules like in my mind what's happening is that people we we celebrate people like Dr. Martin Luther King and we celebrate him as a nonviolent figure and a peaceful figure but throughout the like whitewashing of history that nonviolence has actually turned into like a non-disturbing like people think that nonviolence means never have like always being comfortable and i don't like that's a very upsetting shift in what nonviolent means to me that's my that's my opinion about that agreed i, I mean the the idea that a protest ought not be disturbing ought not be disruptive ought not make people uncomfortable in some way for a vast I mean there are there are protests that don't do that um, but a vast majority of successful protests do operate in that way and I think it's largely understood that it's okay for them to operate that way for a, for a lot of people the idea is when someone has made a decision to be disruptive, they're basically sending a signal that while they may be otherwise well-meaning and not wanting to get in the way and not want to rock the boat, this is a thing that I care so deeply about that it is actually worth causing some disruption and discomfort. That's that's the point. <laughs> the, the whole point is like, this is the thing that I'm, I'm, put, I'm staking my flag in the ground, I'm putting my foot down here. To me, that's actually constitutive of peaceful democratic protests. It's like, this is the thing that I'm going to have things not operate normally in our society. I'm going to, I'm going to be disruptive enough to get you to pay attention. So, because it matters that much. So then like, would you say then that like outsiders should risk, like there should be this sort of level of respect for protesters because if you acknowledge that they're doing this like if this is the thing that they've set their like set their mind to and have devoted themselves to then like they deserve a level of respect maybe yeah this is their cross right i mean this is the thing that they're taking on now because this is the thing that they've decided is so important that they're going to put themselves in the awkward and uncomfortable position of making other people feel awkward and uncomfortable and that's your way of signaling this matters so maybe don't criticize the way they do that. Or at least don't criticize it on the grounds that it's an act of disruption or discomfort. Like, that's the point. Yeah. So we talked to Derek Ford, who's an education professor at DePaul University. And we had asked him if it's ever okay to criticize protesters' methods. And he basically said no. Um, mostly because protesters should be deciding their own methods on a case-by-case -case basis. No, I think that absolutely, without question, ideology and vision has to come first, and then tactics and strategy is decided on the basis of that. And uh, how best to uh, reach that vision uh, in the sort of current social and political and economic coordinates. So I think that, you know, like, to sort of valorize one tactic at the expense of ideology, then you you know, I mean, I have no interest in defending like white supremacists who protest nonviolently, right? I mean, I think that they should be shut down. I think that they should lose. Um, I don't really care like what tactics they deploy, right? Um, and whereas opposed to someone's fighting for, you know, a just cause, then I'm gonna support them, uh, especially if it's, you know, a, like, uh, yeah, and I'm not gonna dictate to different, you know, sort of social groupings, the methods by which they should resist, which happens a lot, because like most of the people denouncing violence are like white people um, who are well off, right? Like petty bourgeois or like really well paid workers in the United States who are then dictating the terms of struggle to oppress people uh, who don't have that sort of luxury to sit around and like, to, you know, ask questions about philosophy and violence and nonviolence. Yeah, and his, I think his idea is that 
yeah, there should be rules for protests, but the rules are collectively determined by the protesters themselves, not, you know, determined by outsiders, you know, outside observers. I mean, surely the methods of protesters matter to some degree. The, the inaugural protesters and the Freeman protesters weren't like this, but take like Antifa protesters, right, where they're actually involved in violence or, or they're actually doing things that seriously endanger the lives of people. I mean, surely we'd be able to focus on that, right? Um, so I like, you know, it kind of depends on what methods are being deployed and what methods are being used. If they're methods that are really particularly violent, um, or very, very dangerous and actually endanger the lives and safety of people, then it seems perfectly appropriate to say, how dare they? So there are certain kinds of protests that seem perfectly appropriate to question the methods of the protesters, like if it's violent protest. Uh, or if it's, if it's endangering the lives or safety of people, there seems to be absolutely nothing wrong with saying, hey, we should stop and think about what we're doing here, and we should think about what they're doing. And they're probably, in a lot of those cases, appropriate subjects of criticism and blame. Well, define violence. Punching people in the face. That, is that, I mean, punching people in the face? Like, that, define violence causing physical harm to someone. Does it have to be a person? What about property? Oh. Um, I don't know if I'd call that violent. Because um, this is, I think, because like, this is kind of my problem with when people start saying like, it's wrong to do it this way. Like, there's often a, a very vague kind of it's, it's just always very vaguely worded. And so I can see saying, like, when you, like, sliced that woman's face open, that was wrong, like, that specific thing, or when you cause another person physical harm. But the problem is when people say violence, a lot of times people mean breaking windows, um, throwing, you know, setting garbage cans on fire. Depending on the manner of the, the, where the fire is and the, the window, that might also fall under safety kinds of concerns. But um, So you don't necessarily object to like property damage, but you do object definitely to like bodily harm to other people. Oh, I haven't. I, I, we're not, I, I was just sort of demarcating that there are clear differences between certain kinds of violent protests and the kinds of protests that Sandra was just describing, and it would be good to... I think what Christian is saying is that it's inherently subjective once you start describing what violence is, is like we're automatically talking about our opinions and what we find acceptable. Because like when you say violence in our heads, or when we say nonviolent in our heads, that we automatically connect that to, to protests we deem acceptable. Right. So it actually includes, for a lot of people, a lot more than just nonviolent tactics. Yeah. And violence actually includes a lot more than just violent tactics. Right. And to, to answer the question, do I have an, obje do I have an objection to the, the property destruction? Uh, to me, a lot of that's parasitic on what kinds of rights I think are at play. So there are going to be certain cases where I think it's appropriate to criticize someone for having broken a window. And there are going to be certain cases where I think, no, it was, it was fine for them to break that window. What are those differences? Well, um, suppose, it's a, a la suppose it's a labor dispute. And um, the protesters are workers. And they have created a product. And they think they're entitled to a certain kind of payment for that product. Um, but the, the corporation is like going back on the agreement. I could see the laborers as an act of protest destroying that property. And I'd be like, well, I mean, they, you know, their grievance is we created this and there's a dispute over who even has a right to the property itself. Right. So when it, when it's a, when it's a dispute about the property right itself, 
it's less clear to me um, that the breaking of the property is, um, or the destruction of the property is, is bad or wrong. There's at least a case to be made that it was a permissible case of destruction. And then a case where you might think that property destruction is not warranted um, is, I mean, suppose it's just like bystander property and you just want to cause a ruckus or something. And so you just like break the windows of people's houses in the neighborhood or something. Um, but those persons are in no way causally responsible for the kind of grievance that you have. Right, I mean, there, there, the destruction of property seems less connected to the aims and goals of the protest. So you might think, in that case, maybe property destruction is at least more plausibly a target of criticism. Yeah, I so the thought that there couldn't be any legitimate so so let I, we need some terminology here right mm -hmm. so 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 we don't get tripped up on can we can we try and get three categories of protest the physically assaulting people kind of violence the gray zone um and then the peaceful zone. like what can we get a word for the gray zone of like, do we call it violent protest or not? We're not really sure. That's where our opinions come into Let's play. Let's call it the gray zone. All right, the gray zone. <laughs> That's, okay. That's easy. Fair enough. So, <laughs> so physical violence protest, gray zone protest, clearly peaceful, uh, clearly not causing damage. Yes. But maybe being, but maybe still being disruptive, like. Yes. In some way. Yeah. Loud, distracting. Yeah. That kind of stuff. I have a view about protests, which, like to me, part of what a protest is, and again, this is part, I'm not saying this is all of what a protest is, but part of what a protest is, is that it makes people mad and that it makes people pay attention to the message of the protesters. And sometimes I think, sometimes I think protesters need to do bad things like break a window that you know break a window of a Starbucks that hey that Starbucks manager didn't do anything you know they need to use tactics like that to get the attention of people in power and to purposefully provoke and make people upset and angry I agree in fact I think that's the one of the main you said not all of a protest I think it's pretty close to uh a lot of what a protest is for. I think the point of a protest is to make people uncomfortable. It's to cause that kind of discomfort to get people to listen and pay attention who might not otherwise do it. One of the things I think is important about protest is it's a way to cause discomfort and get people to pay attention uh, without resulting in war. I mean, I, I, I actually think that that's like kind of what's good about it, right? You know, um, if we didn't have a cultural practice of responding to protest, of listening to protesters, um, then I think you'd just be much more likely to have violent conflict. And so protest is like a pressure release valve. It's a way for people to get away with making things uncomfortable for people without resorting to war um, or war violence. Uh, and so I think it's a kind of replacement for that. Um, just like democracy is a replacement for violent transfers of power, right? But then I don't why is it okay to criticize them? Think about warfare. We, we agree that the point of warfare is to engage in violence to achieve a certain kind of end, um, but we wouldn't say, why is it sometimes okay to criticize soldiers for the way in which they've killed? You might think there are still rules to protest, that there are limits on the discomfort you're allowed to cause, just like you think there are limits on the amount of discomfort you're allowed to cause in wartime. So I think, I think there's gotta be some kind of ground rules about what's okay, but you know how we flesh those out, what those rules are, I don't, I don't have really clear, firm views, but I have an intuitive sense that some things cross lines and some things don't, but I don't, I don't have good, well-worked-out theories as to what that is or not. I think the issue is that nobody ever talks. <laughs> the issue is that everybody always stops at the methods, always, and they're always like, well, you did it this way, therefore I don't have to listen to anything you say about your ideas or anything like that, and I think it's that the methods and talking about the methods becomes always such a massive distraction that 
the reasons that people are protesting um, are overshadowed. Are overshadowed. That's a good way of saying it. Yeah. Okay. So then it seems like the question at hand um, isn't even necessarily under what conditions, if ever, is it okay to criticize gray zone methods? It's um, it has something to do with there's this systemic issue of when criticism happens, it tends to just go straight to the methods, and then we don't we stop thinking about the issues. We don't engage on what the issue is. Basically, okay. So this is where I've arrived to, which is that okay. So we talk about implicit bias all the time. <laughs> like it's the only thing we talk about practically. Have we ever gone a show without talking about <laughs> implicit so. bias? I don't think so. But like, is this a bias? So if we recognize in ourselves that we are more likely to criticize methods of a protest if we're uncomfortable, if we're unwilling to address the m- message of the protest, should we then do our best to refrain from criticizing the methods of a protest like just be just as you would with an implicit bias just be extremely aware of your biases to do so so that you can stop (laughs) honestly once I became aware that that was a problem in my own life it opened me up politically so much more than I ever had been before like examples go um well you know I um, I remember, you know, being in high school and learning about the Black Panthers and seeing um, a picture of the Black Panthers with, like, um, armed with guns. And I thought, oh, well, isn't that terrible? And they're violent and, like, oh, you know, all that stuff. But the more I questioned that line of thinking, the more I questioned, like, you know, being mad at, some, being mad at an African-American man for, you know, arming himself in the 60s, the more I realized, like, oh, like, I w- there was something else going on there. I'm just scared. I was just scared of radicalism. I was just scared of the radicalism of people of color because I had my own race issues that I was still working out. I think it, it also, like, highlights to me, like, if I say, if I see myself questioning somebody's methods and I really look at th- and I interrogate that questioning of somebody's methods, oftentimes it points to me, like, you're being a little transphobic. You're being a little racist, Christian. Like, it kind of highlights some of my other biases that might be coming into play. Yeah, it's like a, it's like maybe if we caught ourselves at the point of questioning methods, it's like a little red light that's like, are you, are you being crazy right now? Are you being like, are you doing an ism? Um, and may, and so that like allows us like, it doesn't mean that we're saying all methods are morally acceptable. It's saying the way we talk about those methods, we're trying to make sure that our own biases aren't leaking into that. I guess that brings us maybe to on what grounds can we criticize people? My sense is there have to be some sort of uh, ground rules for protest, even in the gray zone. Like it's not like morality is just out the door just because you're in the gray zone. Um, so it seems like there's probably still going to be some kind of... M- there's going to be some things that are wrong to do in the gray zone. Um, so it's interesting. So it's like, that's what I think, right? So that was my whole point when I'm trying to engage with this dude online. I was trying to come up with our common ground. Like I was trying to say, like, let's agree on what protests are so that you can stop criticizing these people who are not doing anything wrong. But when we were, I asked Derek Ford about that, like should that be the goal is for us to have like this common understanding about what protesting, like that protesting is good if it looks like this? And he was like, nah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, but I think that like if, um, I think that, those who will oppose, I think it's really still a question of like what the end is and what you're challenging, right? And it doesn't really matter um, how, uh, you know, if you look at like the Black Lives Matter movement and uh, people will say, well, they shouldn't disrupt traffic, right? And then uh, Colin Kaepernick will 
uh, you know, take a take a knee for the you know the national anthem, and they'll say, well, that's being disruptive too. And at some point, it's like, well, literally, what isn't being disruptive, right? Like, there's literally no way. Like when you're challenging white supremacy, there's nothing that the white supremacists are going to say, yes, you can challenge us in this way, right? I know Derek Ford disagrees with me. I think like um, he, he doesn't think that coming to these kinds of ground rules is um, helpful, but I, I, I think I really do. <laughs> and I think like being clear, nonviolent doesn't mean that there, someone is doing something in a way that is acceptable to you. Um, nonviolent means that they are not harming people like you can be disruptive you can it can cost you money it can cost you your job it can cost you your time and all of that is still nonviolent protest and is legitimate and personally I think it's important that we accept those things regardless of your political beliefs um and so that we like we can just have this like foundation and just to be clear, you mean ground rules that like society <clears throat> agrees on, right? Because I think he, yeah. he would say that the protesters can definitely have ground rules for themselves. The collective can have ground rules for themselves. But you mean like everybody, the collective and yeah, like, everybody else. Like basically I want the person who I was talking to about the inauguration, I want him to be able to acknowledge that that was a nonviolent protest. Well... I think we can agree that it's nonviolent, but I think I'm perceiving, and maybe I'm wrong, like a a moral tinge to the nonviolent. No, thing. you are. I'm saying there already is a moral tinge on nonviolent, and so yeah, I'm not putting it there. It is there, and therefore, I am saying I'm not saying your protest is okay because again, you're your what your goals are that's a separate thing that like needs to be morally evaluated but your methods cannot be called into question if you are protesting nonviolently. um but like i guess i guess why do you need that to happen or like why do you why do you need that guy on facebook to agree that the protests were nonviolent? Because I feel like he won't listen to the the actual grievances of people as long as he is blinded by his misunderstanding of what nonviolence means and what peaceful protests look like. But I I have a sense that that guy is going to be blinded by. I mean, if you if he agrees then that it's nonviolent, he, there's going to be something else that you know what I mean. I like, hear you, and like, I understand. Yeah, sorry, you and to- you and Derek totally disagree with me on this, <laughs> and I'm super understanding of that as I make this statement. <laughs> it's so it's a it's a like it's a difference in the way we view people. Like I hold in my heart oh, the yeah. belief that if everyone adhered to certain ground rules, then we would have a greater understanding of one another. And I think. I just think people in, I mean, people in power are in power for a reason, and they're not going to let go of that power. They're not going to let go of it because you're logical. They're not going to let go of it because you're being morally reasonable or that you're morally superior. They're not going to let go of it. They're just not going to let go of it. I mean, until you do something radical. That that's that's Christian Weishardt's opinion. Yeah, I, I don't, hear you. Yeah, <laughs> like, I do hear you on that. Of course, things are open to criticism. Um, I, I mean, I think people, if you kill people, you should be open to criticism. And, but in real life, when, when we're looking at protests, when we see them on TV, before we, we have a gut reaction and we criticize based on whatever we see, I think we should think about what are our reasons for that. I do want to qualify it though. Like if you decided, if you've decided that something is bad enough that it's worth disruption um, or making people uncomfortable don't you want to prioritize targeting first groups or organizations that are the source of that bad thing that's a really good question that we don't have time for today but don't worry we are continuing our ethics of protest discussion at the end of may
man, I am amped. I'm fired up. I still don't know how I feel. <laughs> but tell me about you being amped. I just, um, I, I really appreciated hearing the stories of the men of the Freeman Field Mutiny and then hearing um, all of the like historians and scholars talk about protesting because it just reminds me that I need to give myself permission to break rules because I'm a very buttoned up person. I like to follow rules. I'm very uncomfortable with confrontation and breaking any kind of rules. And so hearing about things like this and talking about things like this just like gives me more conviction to fight for the things that I believe in even if, and kind of especially if it means breaking the rules and causing a disruption. I wish I was as positive as you right now, honestly, because my mind is still like in the gutter of respectability politics (laughs) because a part of me really believes that these, the men of the Freeman Field Mutiny were noble in the way that they handled that protest because it it was so controlled it was so nonviolent, and it was so like perfect in that way but I also don't want to shame people for showing anger in protests and being more like expressive about anger at protest like I don't I don't know you know so I'm kind of caught between those two and then I And then I wonder if it's even, like, a lot of people say, like, oh, respectability politics, it's, like, ruining everything. But in a lot of ways, I think, like, it's human nature to to want to follow respectable leaders and noble leaders who do things that show an extraordinary amount of restraint or respectability, you know? Yeah, yeah. And and as you say that, I'm realizing that that just highlights my own white privilege, right? Because I can, I am in some ways allowed to be angrier and I am allowed to be more expressive of my anger, right? Because I'm a white lady. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a good point. So I don't um, know how to reconcile, like, I'm upset by respectability politics and how they dictate the protesting methods today, but I also totally get why... I, it exists. <laughs> yeah, I think it's, I think it's still, I agree. I, I'm like seeing where you're coming from now, but I still think it's important to remember that at, at some point, no matter how respectably you act and no matter how nobly you act, the powers that be are going to shift the rules again, right? Like, yeah. I think I, I agree with you, but I, I disagree on the part where you say like the common ground part, right? Cause I just don't, I don't think that's ever going to happen, unfortunately. The common ground part, like, that I wish everyone had a common ground that we, like, operated from. Of, like, rules of how to protest, yeah. right? Like, I think those rules, they're just going to, I think people in power, they're going to shift those rules again and again and again. Yeah, I guess there's really, like, no way to fix that problem. <laughs> but, I mean, one thing that I'm going to try to do from now on is to really challenge people when I hear somebody criticizing a protester's methods, I'm going to challenge them to at least talk to me about the protester's message. Agreed. Um, sort of like what um, Derek Ford was bringing up. That So at least to remove like the facade that people hide behind when they're trying to criticize a protester's beliefs, but instead of engaging with that They criticize the protesters' methods. So at least we can remove that and start speaking more openly about, like, what we disagree on with regards to protests. Right. Yeah. That's what I'm going to do. Me too. Cool. So, Christian, I'm still lost, definitely. But those are the conclusions I do have. Yeah. I pretty much have everything figured out. Um, (laughs) I'm right. Everybody else is wrong. <laughs> no. Um, no, this was great. Thank you for helping me constantly question my my pretty strong beliefs. <laughs> me too. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Guys, we just got a breathtakingly beautiful review on iTunes. And let me tell you what happens when we get a review on iTunes. We have this messaging service, Slack, (laughs) and Christian, Andy, and I, as soon as we notice one has come in, 
We literally champagne emojis, <laughs> party emojis, uh, pizza emojis, one hundred emoji. <laughs> like every celebratory emoji is used. We use Giphy mm. to to signify celebration. We all gather in the same room. We literally stop the work that we're doing to read it out loud to each other and celebrate. Yeah. In other words, we're very happy when you leave a nice review for us on iTunes. I weep a little bit. <laughs> okay. So if you want to make us us three the happiest people in the entire world, please go leave us an iTunes review. <laughs> That's the surefire way to our hearts. Or if you have some kind of moral objection to iTunes, I'm sure somebody does. Totally understandable. You can just tell a few friends about us, yeah. and that would be pretty rad, too. Yeah, yeah. You can reach out to us on Twitter, where you can find us at Examining Ethics. We're also on Facebook. And we're also on Instagram now. Oh, yeah, we're on Instagram now. Lots of fun pictures now. Yeah, we're, we're trying out the, um, what's it called where you move? Boomerang. Boomerang. We're trying some boomerangs with our very exciting line of work. <laughs> um. And if you have a comment in general about the show or anything you'd like to say about protests itself, email us a voice memo. And you can send that to examiningethics at gmail.com. And the reason we ask you to comment on protests is because we're actually doing a part two about the ethics of protest at the end of May. Yeah. So watch out for that. And until next time, guys. Goodbye. Bye. Hi, this is Christian, and I'm playing the dangerous game of recording the credits near some water. Examining Ethics with Andy Collison is hosted by the Janet Prindle Institute for Ethics at DePaul University. Sandra Burton and Christian Weishart produced the show. Our logo was created by Evie Brogius. Our music is by Corey Gray, Poddington Bear, Blue Dot Sessions, and Dixie, and can be found online at freemusicarchive.org. Examining Ethics is made possible by the generous support of DePaul alumni, friends of the Prindle Institute, and you, the listeners. Special thanks to the Veteran Voices of Pittsburgh Project for allowing us to use their interview of Wendell Freeland. You can hear his entire interview and find out more about the project by visiting them on the web at veteranvoicesofpittsburgh.com. To tell what happened in his own words. Uh, one of your senses got clipped. You're a clip. <laughs> You're a hair clip. <laughs> That is like that You're sounds a like chip clip. Such a that sounds like such a middle school burn, right? Like yeah. the, like a sick burn that a middle school girl would make up, and it would it would hurt so it would bad, hurt. even though I'm you don't know what I mean. Not a clip. I'm not a hair clip. <laughs> You're a hair clip. I'm not a clip. Jessica. Yeah. Okay.